The Battle of Clontarf, fought on the 23rd of April 1014, is one of the most famous events in Irish history. Originally told as the Irish victory over the Viking invaders, like all good stories, the traditional accounts of the battle are a blend of fact and fiction. In this conflict, the forces of Brian Boru and his allies were pitched against the armies of North Leinster, Dublin and Viking mercenaries from across the sea. There are many books, papers and documentaries on the battle, its background and politics, but very few look at which clans were involved. Here we will try to build a picture of who was at the battle. Unfortunately, very few manuscripts survive and often we are reliant on copies of copies of texts for our information, some written several centuries after the events they describe, with many trying to support a specific narrative, often contradicting each other. Perhaps the most reliable accounts of the Battle of Clontarf are found in the Irish chronicles such as the Annals of Inishfallen, the Chronicum Scotorum and the Annals of Ulster, which contain descriptions of the battle which appear to be based on contemporary reports. Due to these inconsistencies in the Irish manuscripts and the changing nature of political power in medieval Ireland, it is difficult to determine exactly how many people, let alone chiefs and kings, took part in the battle. Some annals suggest as many as 10,000 Irish soldiers died in the battle, along with many Norse warriors. The annals of Ulster, for example, state that thousands and thousands of people were killed while the annals of Inishfallen state that a great slaughter took place. However, they do not provide specific numbers. The battle is a key event in the history of the Vikings in Ireland, as well as the final chapter in the dramatic career of Brian Boru, one of the most famous of all the kings that ever ruled in Ireland. Born in the second quarter of the 10th century into a dynasty that did not have the great pedigree of some of his contemporaries. Though he and his brother's supporters had soon concocted a family tree to feign descent from the ancient kings of the province, it may have fooled very few, but to come from minor noble status to kings of Munster is an achievement that can't be understated. What is more, no king of Munster before Brian had gained general acceptance throughout the country as king of all Ireland, and yet he did. Vikings had haunted the Irish coast since the end of the 8th century, settling shortly after. By the late 10th century, their power was restricted to a handful of ports including Dublin, Waterford and Limerick. These were ruled by kings who fought with each other just as often as they fought with their Irish neighbours. By the time of the Battle of Clontarf, there was a long history of intermarriage and fosterage between Viking and Irish dynasties, which promoted cultural exchanges, alliances and trade across political boundaries. Despite the Vikings' limited nature of their political power in Ireland, they maintained a distinctive identity. Their fleets and armies were still effective in war, and merchants from the Viking ports maintained a network of trading contracts overseas. Soon, the more powerful Irish kings began to seek control of the economic and military resources of the Viking ports to forward their wider political ambitions, and Brian was no different. One factor which aided Brian's rise to power was the support of Viking fleets and fighting men. In 977, Brian had killed Ivar, King of Limerick and his two sons, bringing Limerick under his control. In 984, Brian then allied with Waterford and the Vikings of the Isle of Man against Dublin. In 997, the Enail over King Milshocknam was forced to concede Brian's authority in the south. Until this time, the Enail dynasties had been the prominent force in Irish politics, but their position was now under threat. When Brian defeated the troops of Dublin and Leinster in the Battle of Glenmama in 999, this gave him the confidence to tackle the power of Milshocklan head on. Brian led a series of campaigns aimed at getting his authority recognised across the whole of Ireland gaining the submission 
of the Enails in the north in 1005, although he would be forced to march north and subdue them again in 1006, 1007 and finally in 1010. He had finally asserted his rule when the forces of Dublin and Northern Leinster renewed their war against him and this led directly to the Battle of Clontarf. So who took part in the battle? We will try to build a muster roll based on the petty kingdoms of Ireland and whether their kings took part or not. For those petty kings that didn't, it doesn't necessarily mean clans from those areas did not join the battle. The role of kin and hierarchy in Ireland plays a considerable role in the assertion of authority. They could be ignored if they did not suit political ambition, personal alliances, as well as blood and marriage alliances. But as mentioned with the historical records, we would have no way of knowing the political decisions made at local levels. So we will have to take it that they followed their overlords decisions unless a clan has specifically stated that they attended in their own traditions. Brian was said to be able to levy a royal tribute from Saxons and Britons, specifically from Lennox and Argyll. These were territories that may have lain outside the Kingdom of Alpha in 1014, but Brian's tribute gathering across the seas is not attested in chronicles. Despite indication that he wielded some political influence over the western seaboard of Northern Britain, it is unlikely it was enough to call for levies to be sent. Although some men did come from Scotland, but who and why will be explained in a moment. Within Brian's own battalion, it is said to have consisted of kings of the Kingdom of Muscari and Ara, the Kingdoms of Ely, a branch of the Onocta, the Kingdom of Cúna, the Kingdoms of Corker Baskin, a branch of the Fichra, the Kingdom of Muntamuraha, the Kingdom of Ivaina, the Kingdom of Moilurg, the Kingdom of Connemara. The battalion of Thomond was said to consist of the men of Carberry, the men of Santry, the men of Silaid Slain, the men of Clan Leashock, and branches of the Dal Karsh, including the descendants of Brian's brothers and uncles. The Dal Karsh kindred included the Eat Overcon, the Kelbaith, and the Eat Hurla, along with many others including the Kong Mukni and the Ibrion. Leading them was Muraka Mukbriam, with his own son Turla accompanying him. There is mention in early texts of a third Desmond battalion, made up of northern kings, most notably from Mausiela and Fermanagh. Its leaders were the kings of the Onochtarathlin and the kings of the Dacia. Here is a list of kings and clans mentioned in various sources, but these sources do not state which battalion these men fought within. There will be hundreds if not thousands of names whose traditional lands lay within these borders that may or may not have taken part in the battle. So if your ancestral lands are shown here, there is a possibility your paternal ancestor fought at this battle. According to the book of the War of the Gael with the Foreigners, the Kingdom of Ushuga is said to have not taken part in the battle. A story that victorious but wounded Dalcassian troops were challenged to battle by the King of Ushruga and his allies of Leash as they were returning through his lands. Some authors doubt the validity of the story. Regardless, no kings or chieftains are mentioned in surviving early manuscripts as attending the battle. The Kingdom of Connacht, a certain Cahill Macruha, King of Connacht, as mentioned on later manuscripts as having fought for Brian, as well as Tyg of the White Steed. According to the book of the War of the Gael with the Foreigners, the King of Connacht is mentioned as one of those who sat in council with Brian on the night before the battle. But we do not find any place assigned to the King Tyg among the chieftains in command of the Battle of Connacht. It has been suggested they may have returned home that night before the battle. However, Tyg didn't become King of Connacht till 1015 
and the O'Rourkes were actually ruling over Connacht at the time of the battle. Because of this, we may actually find that the province was split on its loyalties, and some fought with the O'Rourkes and others left with Tighe. if the O'Brien book and the early annals are to be taken as true. Flaherty O'Neill, who was king of the Kinloan, had long been a thorn in Brian's ambitions. His later attack on Meath in 1013 would actually start the chain of events that would lead to the Battle of Clontarf, so it is no surprise that he didn't take part. Although, according to the historians Keating and O'Halloran, Flaherty made an offer of his troops and services, which was declined by Brian, in consequence of some former feuds between them. They also mention a Phelim O'Neill and other Ulster princes fighting at the battle. Regardless of the reasons, it seems unlikely the Enil attended the battle. With Flaherty's overlordship of the Ullid and Kennel O'Connell, it is unlikely many, if any, from these kingdoms took part. Donald MacEamon, Mor Mayor of Mar in Scotland, appears to have commanded a portion of Brian's army, composed of four mercenaries at the left flank of the army. It is stated to have been composed of ten more mares and their Scandinavian allies. Donal may have fought for his own interests, perhaps in opposition to the Earl of Orkney, rather than being a delegate of the King of Alba, although the reasons for his appearance at the battle is often debated. He is the only man from Alba recorded to have died at the Battle of Clontarf, although this isn't unusual as many of the surviving texts of the battle only name those of high status that died. The battle was long in duration, with heavy casualties on both sides. Brian's side was victorious, but Broder killed him. The story that Brian was slain while at prayer first appears in the Chronicle, which Mariana Scotus wrote in Germany over half a century after the battle. It may or may not be true. The bodies of 30 chieftains were sent off to their territorial churches to be interred in their family burial grounds. While the Vikings of Dublin continued to be politically active after the Battle of Clontarf, Brian's reign heralded greater exploitation of Viking towns by Irish rulers. During the 11th and 12th century, Viking rulers increasingly became the minions of powerful Irish kings. Clontarf may be perceived as a state in decline of the Viking power in Ireland. In terms of power struggles between Irish rulers, a great many Irish nobles and lesser kings were killed in the battle, causing succession issues across the island. Neil Shockland would once again become the most important overking in Ireland, but after his death there was a struggle for supremacy among the provincial overkings. When the descendants of Brian rose to eminence again at the end of the 11th century, they celebrated their famous ancestor in literature and propaganda to help justify their claims to dominate Ireland. Those videos are for another time. If you saw your family name or wish to see a video of them, please comment and like below. Also remember to subscribe and check out the merch store. Thank you all for the support. It is greatly appreciated.